All right, let's get going, huh? Let's go, gather up. Come on now. All right, fellas, you gotta remember your body is like day old rice. If it ain't warmed up properly, some real bad stuff. Athletes, take your mark. Get set. It's time for the Attitude Athlete Podcast. Your buddy out there, Coach Blue Robinson here. Hey, I want to thank you all so much for downloading, sharing, and subscribing to the podcast. Greatly appreciate you doing so. As always, if you find anyone that may need any of the content that we have, please share it with them. The best way to get this podcast out a little bit further is to jump on and give us a review. We truly appreciate any feedback that we get. Check out that website, addict2athlete.org. You'll find all of our backlog content. Athletes, I'm excited to have another in-studio guest. I love having in-studio guests because it's a little bit more personal. But this man is is an amazing fella, and I'm excited to have him on here because he's got a great story. He's got a great approach to the way that he's conquering his own addictions and doing it with uh, the, the sense of accomplishment through really putting in the work because you've told yourself it's time to change. Sioni, welcome to the podcast, brother. Why don't you introduce yourself and let's just jump into a little bit about, you know, how you uh, established some of these mindsets now in your addiction recovery. And you have a different form. And I love talking about this topic specifically because so many of us hide from it. But welcome to the podcast, brother. Let's jump into it. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on. I, I've been looking forward to this for a while. And uh, yeah, so my name is Sione Inoke. Born and raised here in good old Utah. Utah. Spanish Fork, Utah mostly. <laughs> um, and uh, have an amazing wife, four amazing sons. And uh, yeah, we're just... Just living the dream now, living huh? Living the dream. I love it, man. Sony, uh, you are no stranger to athletics. Um, you know, when you were a young man, even though you still look very fit and strong, you were uh, high school football, and you really enjoyed that. Talk a little bit about, like, you know, your, your connections to athletics and what that meant to you back then. Yeah, growing up, my dad was a rugby player, really good rugby player. And, uh, you know, I was always around sports, I don't know, like, when it started. I just loved sports. Yeah. Like, as early as I can remember. And something about sports, like, just, I dominated. I felt like I dominated, yeah. like, any sport I played. Absolutely. There was only, like, two sports I think I I tried that I just couldn't do. Didn't and one one of them was racquetball, and I can't, <laughs> think of, <laughs> yeah. can't think of the other one. But, like, I can see that. Racquetball, I tried. Uh, picking up the racket and hitting against the wall and thinking, oh, yeah, I got this, I got this. And I was like, I don't know where the ball's yeah, bouncing. I don't, I don't got this. Yeah, so, but any sport, like basketball, football, even tennis, I picked up, you know, fairly easy. Ping pong, uh, dodgeball, like you name it. Oh, yeah. Like I felt like I wanted to dominate and, and I could and I was athletic enough to, to do well. In, in pretty much every sport. So, you know, you and I met because uh, you you uh, tuned into the Agents of Recovery podcast as well. So you know that we talk a lot about mental health issues on that podcast. And one of the things that you've helped me kind of create here on Team Addict to Athlete was specifically a men's group, focusing just a little bit more than just chemical dependency, but behavioral addictions, things like pornography use, you know, masturbation, uh, gambling, these, these addictions that really wreak havoc in in a man's life that kind of go under underserved and i think that's uh there's a lot of different reasons when you have a chemical dependency issue like a heroin addiction or alcoholism it almost seems more socially acceptable but when someone struggles with let's say pornography it's one of these situations where people kind of like ostracize those individuals they look at it as a, something even more egregious than you know than heroin use but i have you know put together quite a, a portfolio trying to get some some keys and some principles to start helping folks with this and what I've noticed is it is the most underserved population in addiction recovery. Let's jump into like some of the stuff that you've learned about be that behavioral addiction, but also like why do, why do we think so many men struggle with this but do not reach out for help? Yeah, this is uh, an interesting one because like you said, it's very underserved. And I think just speaking from a man's point of view, it's, it's hard to talk about and there's so much judgment and and the hardest thing i think with everything is like the judgment is the easy part from the outsiders right and so it's kind of like what they say about opinions right everybody yeah, has one's one. got one yep you know and uh we fear the judgment 
of in, in partially maybe because we're judging other people, right? Absolutely. But at the same time, it's like so underserved because it's so scary to talk about, uh, specifically with porn. And that's the other thing is like they they say it's not an addiction. Yeah, it's not an addiction. It's not classified as an addiction. It's not in the DSM. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And and you're like. Yeah, it you, is. you tell that to eight out of ten guys. Yep, that it's not an addiction, and tell them to stop. Doesn't work that way. Yeah, they're not just going to stop. It may not be classified as an addiction, but it is definitely serving a purpose. Absolutely, you know, and that's one thing I've appreciated about your insight when we've been uh, developing this men's group uh, for addict to athlete to kind of help you know, serve this population specifically is. Like in the in the brain, it doesn't matter. It still lights up the same parts that cocaine use or, or you know, heroin use would. But the thing is, it's such a what we would perceive as a victimless addiction, right? We don't think we're hurting anybody, you know, when when partaking of of that specific substance, so to speak. But what I've noticed is that it it does something that most of those chemical dependencies don't do which is like kill your soul. Like it's a lot different. Does that make sense? Like it's a different kind of like feeling after the fact. What I've talked to a lot of guys about is that there is such a egregious like feeling within the soul. When you're using a substance or a chemical, it almost feels like, you know, hey, you can ignore that. But immediately after, you know, partaking in, in one of those behavioral addictions, you feel it a lot more heavy. There's a lot more strong opinions about self and it's damn near immediate after. And so you start looking at the, the soul crushing aspects of it. Have you found that to be true? Because it's not like a slowly come down uh, after the drug starts to wear off. It's almost like, dang, what did I do? I fell back into this. And it feels like you're carrying the weight of the guilt of the world on your shoulders. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll touch on a couple of points. And so, I mean, just talking about my story, uh, specifically, like I 100% had an, ad an addiction to porn and it started at the earliest ages. Like I, I honestly have no idea when it started. Yeah. Like some of my earliest memories, I, I talk about this, you know, with people that know me, but like, I remember sneaking out of my room at like four years old, five years old, some, some ages, just so I could, you know, watch those late night yeah. commercials with oh, yeah. girls in bikinis or something yeah. like that. Like, oh, I yeah. don't know where that came from. I, Scratch that. I do know where it came from. Right. But I don't know, like, when that urge or when, when that the lights attention. Turned on. Yeah. yeah. And so it's it's crazy because I look at my son and I'm like, how? Like, how? Because he's five now. I'm like, how did I even yeah. think that that was even a thing? Like, he's in his world. He he can play with toys. And, and here I was, For like. Drawing to adult content type stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, heartbreaking. But the, the the other hard part with this is like, I had a, a talk with my wife yesterday. I was like, how many times do you think I'm going to cry on the podcast? Dude, welcome to, welcome <laughs> to the podcast. I do it quite a bit myself, brother. Um, But yeah, so the other part with this, this particular addiction is it's so easy to hide. It is. It's the easiest thing to hide. And so that's all I did. I, I felt like so many times, never doing that again, never doing that again, never going to like... I, I like you, you start to hate yourself. Absolutely. And, and I didn't know, like being so early on, I didn't know it was, I knew it was bad, but I didn't know why. I knew I shouldn't look at this stuff, but I didn't understand the, the gravity of it and why it was not appropriate. And I just knew like I should have, uh, I shouldn't tell anybody because, you know, I might get in trouble. And so once I finally understood, oh, that's why, you know, I would say I was probably around seven, eight, nine you know, when I finally started understanding like why it was a taboo uh, category or topic and, and, yeah. and everything, then I just wanted to hide it more. Oh, right? yeah. Yeah. You don't stop. You just get better at hiding it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Because mm -hmm. then if anybody found out, whew, we're in trouble. Yeah. Well, and, and here's the other thing too. Like I always prided myself on being a good kid, you know, and, and parents all the time would tell my parents, I love your son so much. He's so respectful. He's so, you know, and so like I liked being that kid. It was easy for me to be that way on the outside, on the underneath side, yeah, the part that I hid. Under that surface. I, I uh, definitely didn't feel that way, right? Yeah. And so it became this, I was living two lives. Right? Yeah. That's the ticket right there, huh? Every, yeah. I, I would believe that anyone that struggles with this, they have to live two lives. Yeah. And... The one life where you're getting the, the, the praise and the credit, it feels so great. And when it's given to you, it's it's completely justified. But in, behind that door, you know that like, 
well, they don't really know who I am. And that's, dude, that is rough. You're right. That's a hard place to be in, isn't it? Yeah. Like, and, and we, I'm in a, a couple of groups now and I've got good mentors and yeah. good people around and you're definitely oh, like thanks, high bro. on my list. So yeah, like you, you feel like you have to be somebody else in the public and then you're a different person, but you always say like, oh, if they really knew who I was. Yeah. Right. Yep. Um, and to that, going back to what you were saying before, like it's a victimless crime for the longest time. I thought that's exactly what it was. Yeah. That's what we think. And, um, you know, I'm only, I'm only hurting myself and nobody else is going to pay the consequences. Well, for me, and especially now that I'm awakened to the fact of it, but like a victim of crime is like, man, like I had no motivation. I had no, like it killed any, any drive that I had, it had killed any like, uh, inspirations or anything like that. And there's a lot of people out there that it probably doesn't do that for them. And they, they're probably really successful and, and really high achievers, but still underneath they're like, that's how I was on the football field. Like I was a high achiever in sports. Oh yeah. So you, you can absolutely achieve greatness on the outside and get the accolades and get the, the praise and, and, and still achieve that. So I'm not saying it's not possible, but what I'm saying is like underneath even these successful people that feel like they've arrived or have this sense of like accomplishment underneath, they're still like hurting and they're still like, I can't beat this. Like no matter what I do. You think about it. It's like, it's like when you get the, the Easter candy, right? And you get that, that chocolate rabbit. You're like, yeah. And it looks great on the outside, but you bite into it. And it's freaking hollow. You're like, what the heck? Yeah. Right. You feel hollow inside. You, you feel hollow, but then also like victimless crime is like who could i have been if i didn't have that weighing on me and if i could have achieved more who who could i have helped so there's yeah. people out there that i know that i've let down because i wasn't at a, a spot in my life that i could have taken action to do something about it yeah man you, you said something a minute ago that i want to touch base on and i think this is very important and you know whenever you're talking about this topic specifically in in any form of recovery People seem to get a little bit of judgment and get judgy about it. But you said even at a young age, you kind of knew it was bad, but you didn't know why. I, I look at that and I think, where does that come from? Is that, is that a spiritual part of awareness? Meaning like no one told you that that was bad, but you had a feeling. And I think, I think intrinsically, we know what's right and what's wrong. And I think just because of the spiritual part of, of our lives, we kind of tune that out when we're partaking of like really negative behaviors. But I'm curious, man, like if you're going to believe in a higher power that uh, really does magnify itself in recovery, you have to also recognize that there's an adversary. There's something that wants to keep you down. And whenever I hear of someone's story like yours, where there's been this, uh, this fight, this battle in between, you know, what you know is to be good and what you know is to be wrong, you start looking at like, okay, so what does the adversary know about you? Like he must know that you're destined for greatness because if you succeed and he fails, the, the millions of thousands of trillions of people that you'll influence will, you know, will, never be, will never be touched by your story, by your compassion, by your friendship. And I think we, it works harder on, on us when we start looking at it in those lenses. But I'm curious, man, back at even a young age, you felt like, man, this is wrong. But you didn't realize the capacity of what that spiritual side of all this is, huh? Because I've talked to lots of guys who have, who have you know, been battling like, pornography addictions. And they say the same thing. They're like, I didn't recognize the, the role that, that spiritual connection played in this. And you can feel it night and day when you have it and when you don't. If you don't mind, man, talk a little bit about that. Like when you started to kind of have that feeling of like, wait a minute, there's something bigger at play here. Maybe I better listen to that instead of, you know, falling victim to my, my mindset, what my mind thinks I need. Yeah. I, I would say, you know, I, I'm definitely a, a member of the, the, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and, and that's the predominant religion out here. And I don't care if you're religious or not, you know, what your views are on it. That's fine. But I always knew, like, that was a piece of me that I wanted to have. I think the, the part that I struggled with is, like, I would go to church, feel the spirit, feel like, oh, yes, like, this is true. This is awesome. Like, I, I feel loved. And then go home and not feel that way because just messed up or whatever. Right. And so it, it was always in the back of my mind. Like I knew that this was wrong, but I knew that I didn't want to just turn away at the same time. Like I didn't want to just like, cause I think a lot of people, I think that's what happens is a lot of people just say, 
you know, uh, I'm not, I'm just going to turn away because it's easier, right? Dude, uh, exactly. And I don't think people realize that. You have to understand that, that, that that kind of an addiction, when we talk about behavioral addictions like this, it changes the biological frame set of mind. Meaning, like, again, when you're introducing a chemical in, you're bringing a foreign substance in. You know, and you know, the removal of that, although difficult and challenging, once it's removed, after about 28 to 30 days, physically, you don't need that anymore. The problem with behavioral addictions like pornography is that it, it, plays, it plays havoc on the biological mindset, the things that you produce and create you know, internally. And so it's not as easy as just stop using the, uh, the substance because sexuality is absolutely everywhere. You know, I talked to a, a young man who said he couldn't, he had a hard time going to church. I know this will piss some people off, but oh, oh well, because, you know, and it's not about what women are wearing, but I need you to understand that this young man who was struggling with a pornography addiction would see the leg of a woman and immediately his mindset would shift to what's, what's going on upstairs, right? Let's follow that thing all the way up. He wouldn't go to any water parks because of, you know, like the, the bikinis and things of that nature. And you can get upset with that and say, well, I have the prerogative to wear what I want. And, and you, you do. It's not, it has nothing to do with you as a female. What it is, is it shows you how, like, how much of a plague pornography is because it, it rewires the biological parts of your brain, which means that to, in order to overcome this, you have to seriously try to rewire your brain. That's not easy to do, is it? No, not at all. And I don't know where I heard this from, but I remember hearing early on that like, oh, addictions, and, and they were probably, I think they were talking specifically about like drug addictions or whatever. I don't know if they were talking about porn or, or, or drugs or what, but they said like you start needing more and you start needing more and you start needing more and you build up a tolerance. And so I think I was lucky like hearing that, like I'm not justifying anything that I did, but um, I didn't let the porn go into crazy avenues. Yeah. Going down that rabbit hole, right? That is a struggle with, with porn is like, and that's what I, I feel so bad with these kids these days. Yeah. So much easier to access it than I, than when I was growing up. Yeah, dude, same thing. I mean, I remember when, when I was young, probably about uh, maybe 9, 10, 11, right? In Provo where I was growing up, because we bounced around a lot, but there was a house we lived in in Provo for, for a few years. And just kind of through the house in the neighborhood was this big, huge, like open like field. It was a field with like Russian olive trees and stuff. We'd go in there and play and goof off. And one day we were playing hide and seek in there and me and my buddy stumbled upon a box of Playboy. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what is this? And it, dude, I remember it was the craziest thing to be like, what is this doing here? And of course it's in the field, like hidden, you know, like some teenagers probably stashed it there, sell their dad stuff. But I remember like that it's was probably the dad. Yeah. It could have been, <laughs> could have been old farmer Ted out there. But I remember like we, me and my buddy were like, let's not tell anybody because we don't want to lose this now. Right. It was the weirdest thing. It was like this coveted kind of like a holy grail. Right. And I think there's a natural curiosity that we have and we can't, we can't shame that because it's, it's in the DNA. And you're right. I mean, to, to look at something like that, we had to make the extra effort to find it in the field and to do all these things, or maybe watch HBO for whatever adult movies on. Um, it wasn't as easy or as accessible as it is now, you know? And so I kind of highlight the reasons why I didn't get too deep into it is because I didn't have access to it. I mean, we were dirt poor. We didn't have pay channels. We didn't have any of that stuff. And so I'm kind of like, I look at it now, I'm like, wow, I was very lucky not to have like the influx of it, despite the fact that the, the way that our lifestyles was, the way my mom chose to, to raise us was was very much, um, I, I think, a, a, a playing field that would absolutely introduce that to our lives. But kids nowadays, dude, it's on phones. It's on, it's, it's, you know, I was scrolling through some stuff on Facebook and all of a sudden, like there was full on nudity on Facebook. I'm like, what the heck? You know? And so you get on your report, but I'm like, it is, it's we're being inundated by it and there are those that say well it's no big deal it's a sign of the times it's you know, just common but then there's that other side of it. it's like no you don't want your, your 9 10 11 year old kid being exposed to that yet but what do we do i mean the 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 hardest part for me like with the kids nowadays is like it teaches them not to like appreciate a woman not to they they just become objects and um going just going back to mine like i being the star athlete being the captain of the football team like all that stuff i didn't have girlfriends i had girlfriends for like a couple days you know 
or or whatever. But that was also because I had this fear. Like I I wanted to, I knew that what I watched was not real. And so I was able to like, again, be somebody else in the light, but somebody else in the dark. And so in the light, like I wanted to treat women with respect and, and girls with respect. And like, so I could friend zone hard. Like I could friend zone people really hard. And uh, I feel like, again, maybe I'm just a little unique. But at this at this point, the kids, when they're exposed to that, it teaches them to just look at them as like an object and not a person. And that's what I fear. And, and I see it like even in today, you see behaviors that men are showing. That's like it's not it's not good. It's not good. Like men are not being men. Yeah, I see it. I see it. The other day, my, my daughter came home. She's you know, 18. She's like, um, she's like within a couple of weeks of graduate, a couple of I might, what, month and a half away from graduating. And she's already got a like, college plan set out and whatnot. And she was over at a friend's house doing some math homework. And, you know, slowly but surely all of the friends started kind of piling in doing homework and stuff. And she said there was one, one young man who came in and sat down next to her and flipped up his laptop. And immediately she said porn. And he was trying to scream to turn it off by clicking the you know the little red X up there, but all that would do it was then reveal the ne- the one behind it and the one behind it and the one behind it. And he looked at her and he's like, "I am so sorry you saw that." And you know, my daughter, she's grown up in addict to athlete. She knows what addictions and stuff. And she's like, "That was so hard for me to see, not because of what visually I saw, but she's like, what I knew it was doing to him." Because those are the kind of things you don't realize, right? Like you will eventually get caught, you know, and specifically if you try to get into a relationship. I mean, the thing that I think most people need to understand is that at that point, it's not about the sexual aspect of of you and pornography, which is kind of a hard thing to wrap your head around, right? You think, well, of course, it's a sexual act. It has to be something that you don't have sexually or you're not, you know, you're not you're getting enough from your spouse. It has nothing to do with it. It's more about that cause and effect of, of the, you know, the, the after effects of the addiction itself. Meaning like when you take a substance, you have the, the side effects of whatever substance you take, then that's what you like, the euphoria. The same thing happens with pornography. It's the pornography, the viewing, the masturbation, the release. It's those things that kind of connect that feel good chemical in your brain, right? And that dopamine dump. And so when someone sees this on your computer, on your phone or whatnot, you know, especially if it's man who has the issue and woman who finds it, it's going to affect the spouse a lot more deep than you might think, right? I mean, and I, and, and that's how Savannah was, my daughter was telling me, she's like, it just, it just crushed me, not because of what I saw, but because she was like, I knew that he was struggling, I knew he was in pain, and he, and he, poor kid, apologized left and right, but what do you do, right? What, I mean, you're, you're exposed, you're caught. So, you know, I have a couple of, of people I'm working with that have been in a situation, one that's had a long time history of use, um, because there's been some emotional drifting just in in the relationship, you know, years of marriage um, and not a lot of emotional or physical intimacy. And there's that retreat to that, you know, th- I know guaranteed I'll be able to have, even if it's an imaginary connection on the, on the phone. What does that do to a relationship, man? What does it do kind of like when, when the cat's out of the bag, so to speak? Uh, the other part of, of this story for me is, uh, again, I hit it for years, like, I'm 39. I think this has all come out within the last couple of years. So two, three years. My wife, I mentioned, she's amazing. Mary's the smartest person. She's, she's awesome. She will, she's the strongest person. She she uh, is very uh, logical in like, like, this is why this makes sense. This is why this doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. And she will tell me that I'm wrong millions of times and she will prove herself right. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> but, yeah. Talking about that victimless crime, like we were uh, talking one night <clears throat> and she just casually asked like, hey, have you ever looked at porn? And here I was like, I've I've kept it on my shoulders and kept it to myself for like so long. Yeah, I tried to tell like someone in, in my church, mm-hmm. like, yeah, I, you know, I, I looked at it once and, you know, because that's what we do. We yeah. like, play it down. We downplay it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so... I was, that was like my cry for help, really. But, but uh, you know, nothing happened. I was like, you're supposed to help me. Like, isn't that what you guys yeah, are supposed yeah. to do? Yeah, where's the, where's the help? Where's the manual? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so uh, I shut in again. I was like, well, I'm never telling anybody else again, right? Because right. that didn't help. That didn't work. And so so here I was. Like, she asked me, hey, do you, have you ever looked at porn? I was like, 
oh, finally, like I can get this off my chest. Yeah. And I said, yeah. I was like, it felt like a, such a big release for me because I kept it all to myself for so long. Man. And then, um, like it wasn't that big of a deal that night, but then I think it clicked for her, like how much of a problem it was. Right. Like. Not just has he, but like how much is he? Yeah. Okay. And so, um, like that next day she was like, I was like, oh man, like, thank you. Like talking about that it was like a big release. So I was feeling good about it. Right. And then she was just kind of like. You, you got out. She went in. Yeah. Like, wait a minute. Okay. Yep. And so um, that was the first time in my life that I realized that I'd hurt somebody besides myself. And uh, so what do I do? Never doing that again. And for the longest time, like I, like I, I had my longest stretch mm -hmm. where I, I never, never turned to it. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And uh, it still crept, crept back in because I didn't understand it. I, well, exactly. Just because the cat's out of the bag doesn't mean that it's solved. Yep. Yeah, it makes sense. And one thing with any addiction, mm -hmm. you, you can't do it for anybody else. No. It has to be done for yourself. Yep, you're right. And uh, when it crept back in, what did I do? What I had always done, I just hit it. I hit it. And probably better. Because I knew, because, yeah. I knew it hurt her. Yep. And so it finally crept up again. This was probably a couple years later. I had hit it for another couple couple years or so but uh came back out uh, just like that kid at the party yeah yep pulled up open the ipad and there it was there it was mm -hmm. and she's like um i just saw this and i went silent so she knew hold on one second i remember when marissa called me out on some of my attributes of lying and just suppressing some of who i was and when she finally call, like, called me to the carpet and said you know who are you really? What's going on with you? Why are you so secretive? Because I didn't want them to know my history of, of poverty and abuse and all this kind of stuff. And I remember when she finally asked me flat out, the same thing happened, Sione. I was like, I was speechless. I didn't know how to answer. So I know what that feeling's like under a, a different maybe experience. But like when you are called like that and you know you got to tell the truth, but you know that truth is going to hurt. It, like, we it's silence. I've never had that problem ever. I could cock whip up a lie or an excuse so fast, but it sounds like it was the exact same train you're on that I was on where it's like, I'm just stupid. I'm like quiet. And that spoke a million words. Yep. You remember that? Yeah. Yep. And so that was the thing. Like what that event, like we were going to get divorced, like we were done. And uh, I knew it was my fault and I knew like, okay. And so that's when we <laughs> An answer to the prayer, we uh, she was willing to give it a shot, but she said, we need to go to marriage counseling. And so we booked an appointment, random place in, in Springville, Utah. Um, I had never done therapy in my life. And I didn't know what to, ex I didn't know what to expect. And so we walk into this office of this place and we sit down and who's our counselor? Blue Robinson. And so <laughs> it, we, uh, I, I remember that. Uh, I remember we that. We sit bro. down and we share our story and you tell me like, Hey, just so you know, I, I actually specialize in addiction and tendencies and all that stuff. And like, that was like, mm -hmm. that was the wildest thing. And, uh, yeah, man, like, like that alone helped us. But at the same time, it's still new, right? It was right. still new. I didn't, I didn't, I was going to take time, going to take time. I didn't know what betrayal trauma was. Right. Um, and now I do. Right. And now Mary does. Mm -hmm. And like, it's a whole thing, but. I can't remember the original question, but like... No, that's it. The, 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 the downfall, like when it's revealed and everything that falls out behind it. Betrayal trauma is a very real thing. And listeners, that's something you have to be very key about is that even though you may have had this awakening where you're like, I'm done and you have this new invigorated feeling of like, I'm going to conquer this. There are still people that are left in the wake of, of your addictions and your tendencies that feel as though you've, you've screwed them over. And that betrayal trauma is very real and it's hard to wrap your head around because you're upset, but at the same time, you still love that person, but you don't know if you're, you know, to a certain degree, loving them 
to spiritually, emotionally, or physical death, right? So it does. It takes a lot of time. And trust, trust is a gift. It's not something that you earn. Like you can't just earn trust. I think that's the funniest thing when you think about it, Sione. Think about that for a sec. I had my, my cousin, um, one, one year he was like wanting to take his dad's Bronco to uh, to the, um, the prom. So for the whole summer, the whole year, man, he's doing chores. He's Johnny on the spot. He's like building trust. And then the prom night comes, he takes the, the Bronco. The next day I call him like, dude, how was it? He's like, it was, you know, it was good until I got home. I'm like, what happened? And his dad came out and saw one little tiny scratch on his Bronco and said, you're never driving this again. And he's like, I did all of that. He's like, I'm not even sure if I did that. But I thought, dude, that sucks. That means he, he spent his whole summer and, and part of that year building, building trust only to have it immediately taken away. And that hit me then. It's like, it's a gift. It's a gift. Trust is a gift. Like, here you go. Handle this with care because if you drop it or if you damage it or if you, you know, disrespect it, I'm just going to take it back for a little while and then I'll give it back to you. So that's kind of how it is, right? Like it's a gift of trust and you've got to be careful with it, but it flipping takes time, doesn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and even still, like, it's an ongoing thing. There's little things that can, I know this now, but like, again, I'm not perfect. Like even when this whole thing came out and even though we, Mary and I both know like what addictions are, what my, what my trauma was, what, what my coping mechanisms were, why, like all of that, we, we have a better understanding of all of that now and, and what betrayal trauma is, but I've still lied about something or, like small or, or, you know, and, and it comes out. But that, that lie, like, takes that trust and pushes it further down, right? Yeah. So now you have to build up a stack of, of this is what I'm going to do. This is how, exactly. integrity is, is the biggest thing. Um, and so, like, you got to do what you say you're going to do. Oh, man. And, and you took that to heart, you know? Like, um, I'll fill in just a little bit of a gap because I want to get to that point because I don't want to run out of time to, to touch base on this. But you know, uh, very involved and then life kind of takes over and, you know, we don't expect everybody to be here forever, but you had to come back and be like, man, all right, I'm, I'm kind of slipping, but you made some promises to yourself. And the one that I thought was absolutely amazing is that you said, I'm, I'm done not believing in myself. But if I say I'm, I'm going to do something, I have to do it. Not for my, not for my wife, not for my kids, but for me, we don't do that. Sione. we don't do things for ourselves. We do it because we want others to believe in us or love us or give us that time what you did to kind of like put yourself now this sounds kind of funny but put yourself first which you which we all should do that was 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 amazing to me because you said i'm sick of lying to myself not lying to my wife or lying to my kids or lying to the, my friends and family it's i'm sick of doing it to myself that's a huge awakening tell us a little bit about what you did and that promise that you made yourself that commitment you made to yourself yeah so i uh, again with addiction i uh, uh we found you we got the help and again like it was like finally i got answers to why i do this right but under under it all i still had self beliefs and still because again thousands and thousands and thousands of times over 30 plus years of saying i'll never do that again and then you do it again and what do you tell yourself i can't keep promises like i'm never I, I'm just lying to myself and it showed up like in, in other ways, like I'd show up and, and tell, I told my brother when he left on, you know, for his two year mission, he was going to uh, Nicaragua, Spanish speaking country. I was like, Hey, I'm going to learn Spanish. So when you get back, we can, we can talk. That was another thing. I didn't learn Spanish. I, I studied for like a week and then stopped. And then he came home he's like, I thought you were going to learn Spanish. And I was like, yeah, but I knew Underneath, I wouldn't because I, I don't, I never keep my word. And, and it showed up in friends and showing up to like, like hangout nights or whatever. Like, I'll, I'll be there with every intention to, to do that. Just want to show up, and then I would reinforce to myself, well, I never follow through with anything anyway, right? So you stack up those losses and thousands of losses, like thousands and thousands of losses. And and uh, when I realized that, because we had come to you, uh, we actually, uh, this is a if you're not a member of the church, going to the temple is a, a big accomplishment. We had we had gone to the temple, and uh, I felt like cool, I've arrived. But there were there were other things going on with my business. Started feeling bad for myself. Like I had huge losses that I never had in my life. And uh, what did I do? I started to go inward. Go back to what's familiar. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. And so I relapsed. And again, it wasn't very long. 
but it was long enough. And that's when I had to reveal to Mary. She called me out because she knew I was standoffish. Yeah. She's like, wait a minute. These are old behaviors. Yeah. 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 So she called me out and she's like, what's going on? I had to reveal it to her. And so, right. uh, So I did have a relapse and it was after that time, like I was telling myself like, man, like I, I'm tired of breaking promises to other people, but I had to look, why do I break promises to other people? And it was because I break promises to myself time and time and time again. And so that was when I had the realization, like, no, if I can't keep a promise to myself, I can't keep a promise to anybody. And so I, I started doing something. I, I've, so I started hiking the Y every morning. I've now hiked the Y almost every morning since. But um, for those of you guys that don't know what that is, here in, in Provo, Utah, with the college, the University of Brigham Young University, up on the mountain is, is the, uh, the, the big letter Y kind of representing BYU, right? And it is a very steep and and uh, it's a tough hike. And there's how many switchbacks are there? There's like 10, 11, 12, uh, something like that? 12, 12 total. And it's like a little bit of a 13, but it the, looks easier than it is. Um, and it takes some effort to do this. But once you get up there, you got an amazing view and it's kind of a cool thing to see. But so it's, it's not convenient. It's very inconvenient. But you thought, and I'm curious why you chose that. Why, what was the reason for that specific place for you to, to go? I honestly don't have a reason. I, I don't know why I chose it's that like, one specifically. It's like, Sione, why was that your why, right? <laughs> right. I, I, I haven't thought much about why that oh, was there, the why. I bet you, you do a little soul search, and there's a reason you chose the why to hike, right? I mean, what's your why? I, I think that's probably the name of this podcast for you, <laughs> but uh, it is. So <clears throat> you started, and what happened? And that was, yeah, when I, when I started hiking the why, it, it's, you're right, it's not a, a long hike, but it's super steep. It's tough. Mm-hmm. And um, I just started keeping promises to myself for the first time in my life. I felt like, oh my gosh, like I'm following through with something I actually say. And so, I mean, this is still recent-ish. Uh, um, it's been about six months. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, like September, October when you first started doing it, right? Yeah. August, September, October, somewhere around there. And, uh, and that's been a huge game changer for me. Just because... It gives me time to myself and when you're hiking time in nature and it's cold in the mornings. It's I remember that. I remember asking you, what's going to happen when it snows? And you're like, I'm going to keep going. And I'm like, dude, what? Because I, I, I'll find a reason not to do it. And you're like, I'm still going because I made a promise to myself. It's huge, man. And so that's what I did. Like even when it's covered in ice and snow, I put those little crampon yeah. things on my little shoes. Little spikes and, on your shoes yep. and go and for keep it. Keep going. And the cool thing I, I like about that brother is, you know, during all that time too, because I focus a lot of my time and attention on chemical dependency. And I've learned real quick that I've, that, that behavioral addictions like pornography use and chemical dependency are two very different things. They're, they're different beasts. They, they affect the same parts of the mind and, you know, really damaging the soul, but they're different. And so as you were coming to Addict to Athlete, the main you know, emphasis is chemical dependency. The principles still work for behavior, like things, but I decided, I'm like, we've got to put a better resource together. So for the last year, I've been putting together, um, you know, my own kind of understanding of where pornography addiction and, and, you know, again, like gambling and all that kind of stuff, behavior addictions, where they, where they fit in my model of recovery. And when we started the, the, the addict athlete men's group specific to talk about these issues, you were you you were a huge part of the reason why I decided to do this, um, and it's growing. We're getting we're getting some traction, but like you said, this room should be filled to capacity, you know. And we've been doing this now for about three months, and you know our circle is small right now. Why do you think men have a real hard time? It's almost like they don't dare come until they've been discovered. What advice would you give the guy who's going to listen to this? That's like, I gotta I gotta stop pretending like pornography is, is this doomsday like addiction and just show up because I'm done with it. Like, does that make sense? Like us guys, when we have the hardest time asking for help, you know, as well as I do, that room should be bursting at the seams. A hundred percent. What do you, th- what do you think about that, man? One pride. Pride. Like, uh, men don't want to admit that they have a problem and they probably don't see it as a problem. They're like, oh, it's just a little 
release. I'm good. Like I'm, I'm, you know, I barely use it. And what's funny, we had a guy come to the meeting. He's like, oh, I, I don't really have a problem. I just wanted to check this out. I'm like, well, I'm glad you're here. Yeah. But that tells me that you do have a problem. <laughs> exactly. Just the fact that yeah, you're don't here. Don't worry about it. Just come. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't care. Like, like it's not a big deal is the biggest issue. And the, the fact that there's people out there saying like, it's okay. He's a guy. It's normal. Like, one, it's not normal. Like, you, you, you think about normal, like, go back to, like, World War One. Go back to, go back even before that. Like, there wasn't pornography. Not at, no. I, I mean, no. there was, but, but, but. Not like what we've got not, today. Yeah, not like, it wasn't normal. Mm-hmm. Like, you justify it now, like, oh, he's, he's just a man. He's just, that's, that's not normal. Like, sex is normal. Like, being sexual is normal, but pornography is, has nothing to do with that. And that's that's the thing that people don't understand is like, it's not about sex. It's not, has nothing to do with it. It's a coping mechanism. And because they don't realize it, like they don't think that they have a problem. And, th- and that's a doomsday button. If you, if you ask me, that's like a, that's like one of those things where, you know, if, if, you don't show the weakness, then you don't have a problem. But that's, but you know, it's, it's just like you do. You live two lives. You, you have to. And again, it's not as noticeable as, you know, the weight loss if you're using heroin or if you're using methamphetamines. Is you know, you, you don't see the downfall of of your social life and whatnot. But it's it's in other subtle ways. It's other subtle signs. So. I guess what we're saying here, listeners, is that, you know, if, if you or a friend or partner or you know, husband, whatever, if you're struggling, reach out. Like one thing I want to do that I did with Addict to Athlete was start to destigmatize what an addict is. And I think we've done a great job at that, but we need to now turn our attentions to these kind of addictions so that everyone doesn't feel so taboo. I mean, I remember you said that you had spoke about this at the pulpit of, of the church and, you know, kind of gave a, a little testimony of what recovery looks like, and what you struggled with. And I can only imagine in a, in a, in a atmosphere of you know, a couple hundred guys um, all gradually start to put their phones down as they're sitting in, in a meeting and start looking at you like, is he really talking about this? But only having one or two guys come up to you after and be like, I think I need what you have. When you know damn well there's you know more than half of those guys, if not dang near every one of them, have had this issue. It's that prevalent. Yeah, 100%. And, and I would say after I gave my testimony and, and, and shared, you know, what I was going through and, and that there's hope and there's, you know, resources. I actually had a lot of people come up and shake my hand and say, thank you. Like, and, and that was amazing. And, and, you know, only like one or two of them have actually reached out, but I had like a line of people wanted to shake my hand and thank me after I, after I shared it. And so that's the thing again, pride, right? And here's the other thing, like, if if they were to say, hey, I'm going to go with Sione to this meeting. Oh, what's the meeting about to the wife? Well, you know, then now you have to, might have to come clean, right? Or you might have to have a, a situation like you and Mary were, were in where you've got to have a conversation, you know, and again, hats off to her because, you know, it, it was hard for her. I remember her being very taken aback by that and the love that she has for you is a lot deeper than I think even you had thought because you know, I for sure have screwed this one up. Like this is game over. That is incredible. Um, and, and when, and we have a few other group members that have situations like that, but that's not the norm. I've seen this as I've served as a Bishop in the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I've seen marriages completely fail because of this. And I'm thinking, you know, and I told you, I told both you and Mary this, like you guys will be a power couple and you will save a lot of marriages if you guys can save your own right now. And I still believe that. I think you're, you're, you think you're doing it, but man, it is like, uh, you, we, you've got to have those hard conversations. Don't hide from the pain that it might cause. We talked about this last night in our meeting. It's your resistance to what is it causes your suffering. So if there's pornography use and you're resisting talking about it, it's causing suffering. You've got to lean into it. And that's why we're here to help. Me, Sione, uh, our group, that's why we're here We're here to help. So there's no sense in, in just you know, maintaining that path, is there? Yeah, and, and, and I'll say this like as a piece of advice and maybe hope, but for those that are struggling and they know it, you don't have to live there. You You don't have to live in that I'm a piece of crap. I just, I'm worthless. I'm never, you know, going to be good enough. Yeah. That's the dark side. Right. Mm -hmm. 
and you might be a different person in the light, but it still creeps in. Like it's still gonna, mm -hmm. it's still gonna affect who you are in the light. Um, and Absolutely. I didn't realize that. Like I said, I, for the longest time, I, I, I don't know who I could have been if I would have found the help and resources when I was younger, right? If I was 18 and I found the help and the resources and like understood what addiction was and understood what my traumas were and, and, and all of that stuff. I don't know who I could have been by now, right? Um, I do know that I'm, I'm here now. Yeah. And now that I know it, I know who I can be. And that's the other thing, like people, people ask me, like, are you afraid, you know, to share this? Because again, the that's judgment, the right? Line. Yeah. That, that, oh, I don't want, I don't want them around my kids. That's fine. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't care. Like there's never been an issue, never would be an issue, mm -hmm. but, but that's on you. Like you don't have to trust me. Yeah. I don't need that. I know who I am. Exactly, brother. I know who I am and, and how, how I am and how I show up now and like. 100%. And so that's, that's the, if, if that's the, I don't know if that's for advice but, or hope, but like you don't have to stay there. Nope. You don't have to stay in that darkness. Nope. It's a choice. I'm with you, man. Brother, I appreciate you jumping in here. And I know that we're going to have to have you back on because there's, there's a lot more. And as this one gets out, I know for sure we'll have a lot of folks reaching out. So do so. Jump on the website, addicttoathlete.org. You'll find all of our content on there. And we'll post this, uh, this, this one for you. And this might be one you need to keep just in case you need to have a little something to listen to before you guys talk about an issue. And I think it'd be a great way to break the ice because there's help available and you don't have to just settle for that. So athletes, again, thank you so much for downloading, sharing, and subscribing. Do your best every week, every day to turn your mess into your message.